Hey everybody, Isaac here, and welcome to the sixth episode of Between Two Cats, the podcast where we take a peek behind the curtain of the biggest names in the quantum programming community. In this episode, I got to sit down with Zoe Holmes, who is a professor of physics at EPFL. Zoe's done a lot of great work recently on the more theoretical side of quantum machine learning, and I definitely recommend that you check out some of her papers. I had a lot of fun talking to Zoe in this interview. Um, it was her first time in Canada, so she experienced a few things that are very Canadian. Um, that was fun to talk with her about. Um, among many other things. <laughs> anyway, I really hope that you enjoy this video. Subscribe to the channel if you want to know when more of these episodes drop. Give this video a like if you liked it. And without further ado, here's Zoe. Uh, we already kind of chatted a little bit, but uh, yeah, how are you doing today? <laughs> We're going to do that again. We're going to do it again. We are, uh, just for the camera. What did camera. I say? I said I was hungry because I'd forgotten to eat lunch. Right. Um, so I ate a yogurt. Right. And then I asked you about Canada versus America. Right, right. Uh, but how am I? Yeah, good. Busy. Enjoying being here. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So uh, is this your first time in Canada, yeah, in Toronto? first time in Canada. First time in okay, Canada. Okay, cool, cool. How's it been and what are your like first impressions? I went to the hockey on Sunday. And oh, you that did? Was so much fun. Okay, great. So, so much fun. Uh, Leafs played... Nah, nah. The Leafs weren't here. It was the Marlies. Oh, the Marlies. Okay. The Marlies against the Checkers. The the, 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 so someone from Charlotte in South I need Carolina. to look this up. Okay, so I'm a big hockey fan. So It was a good match. Match, match or game? Game. Game. Okay. Yeah, you're used to you, the Charlotte Checkers. Yeah. 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 So that's like the just the league below the NHL. Yeah, but, but I would not have been able yeah, to yeah, tell yeah. the difference. So, you, that, but that was probably a lot of fun. Hockey's so much fun. So good. Yeah, like, yeah. Okay, so we had no idea of the rules. Mm -hmm. Um, I got my poutine and my beer in like a tin glass, um, and I mean, I really like the refs. They were like super camp, like sort of kind of like wiggling their hips and like ice skating backwards. Um, completely <laughs> unnecessarily, I think. Um, or at least that was how it seemed to me. Yeah. Um, and I'm not going to lie, the violence is quite refreshing. <laughs> <laughs> that's part of hot. And, and something about the, uh, the AHL too is that's the, that's the league. Um, those are all the guys that are trying to like prove themselves. So they kind of, well, one thing in hockey is yes, like there is fighting and stuff like that. Um, but uh, yeah, they're all trying to like prove themselves. So they kind of, it is a thing that like the, the, the league, like the AHL is like a lot more aggressive than, than the NHL, like so the full-time league. At the same time, like, I feel like they look a little bit ridiculous in all their padding. And so Gotta it's wear like it. these kind of toy superheroes that are attacking each other. <laughs> and then there's sort of overly dramatic music in the background. Yep. Um, so I couldn't really take it seriously, but well, it was good. damn good. Like it, yeah. so they went two up, and then the opposing side actually caught up, so it was two all. And then um, the Marlies got another goal in. Most of these goals I didn't see because the puck was moving too fast and my eyes not conditioned enough. Mm. And then at the last minute, the Charlies decided, Charlies the checkers, checkers. decided that they were going to get rid of their goalkeeper and just have six players on, which was confusing but exciting. Yeah, you pull the goalie at the end yep. to put an extra man on to yep. try and get another goal. Um, yeah. And then the Marlies managed to get around on the score. So it was 4-2 in the end. Sweet. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Cool. That's like great. That's like a quintessential Canadian experience. So I love that you were able to do like, that. I wasn't sure what else I was meant to do as a tourist here, but going to, okay, so when I was living in New Mexico, I really wanted to go to a hockey game and I never got around to going to a hockey game. See, I'm calling it hockey now. I want to call it ice hockey. Um, uh, yeah. Because yeah. um, <laughs> in the UK, we'd call it ice hockey. Yeah, yeah, because field hockey is relatively exactly. popular. Like if you call too. hockey, then people think you're talking about the, right. the, the summer game. Right. But yeah, so I've been on my list for a while. I was here, I had a day to kill. I went. It was good. That's great. I'm so glad you got to got to experience that. Okay, cool. Enough, enough of the little hockey rant because there's probably not a lot, a lot of hockey fans out there who are going to watch this. But, but maybe they should go and watch a game. Because you know then what? They might get be, be converted. Yeah, I, uh, I I agree. I I prescribe to this. I subscribe to this. Um, yeah, I was just in I was just in Buffalo last week for for a hockey game to like watch the NHL. Are you watching the Leafs? Uh, no, they were actually playing uh, some... I'm not a Leafs fan. Okay, because you're not quite local enough to be Leafs. Well, I grew up as as a Sabres fan, like a, a Buffalo Sabres fan, like in Buffalo. I don't know, I just as a kid, I watched the team and just kind of liked it. Buffalo is relatively close to where I grew up, okay. too. Equidistant from Toronto for me. Okay. So, like, two and a half hours to Buffalo, two and a half hours to Toronto. It's in the States, yeah, but okay. it's really close to the border. Okay. and. Um, yeah, it's just the team that I grew up on, but 
um, yeah, no, big hockey fan. So oh. I'm super glad that you like hockey. That makes me happy. That's super awesome. Cool. Um, all right. Now back to like, you know, like research, research stuff. <laughs> um, okay. So you're a recently graduated PhD student as of, you know, a few years ago, yep. 2019. Now you're a full-time prof for about a year and a half. Um, what's it been like the, the first year of being a professor? Um, it's been, it's been good. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously there was the fear in advance that I would absolutely crash and burn mm. and I've not absolutely crashed and burned. So I'm taking that as an overwhelming success. Cool. Um, I have a group. Um, I think there's a good vibe in the group. I think we like working together. I think people are excited to be working on things. Mm. Um, you can be critical of this, but we are the type of group where we will suddenly get excited by something at 10 o'clock at night and end up frantically messaging about it on Slack. Um, I think that's a sign that people are happy to be working rather yep. than a sort of unhealthy working attitude. But yeah, and I'm sure that the people who do want to tune out can just yeah, tune exactly. out, yeah, I mean, catch up in the morning. I had my students telling me, I was taking some vacation, and they were like, Zoe. And it, they were, I was sort of saying, oh, well, I, if, I, if you poke me, I might reply. And they were like, no, don't reply. Okay, on the topic of being a professor, you, res I, you know, I, I, I do some research on all you guys and, you know, kind of see what I can dig up. Um, you recently tweeted not, the not so glamorous part of, of professor life. You were stranded at an airport and you said the less glamorous side to new faculty life. Stranded at an airport for the fourth time this year. Yeah, I think I'm unlucky. I You're don't unlucky. think it's quite this bad, but I have, have been stranded. Um, okay, so I had a flight cancelled back from Barcelona. I had to spend an extra night there. Oh, um, that sucks. You say that. <laughs> you say that. I was frantically resubmitting a grant that had been rejected. Oh, okay. And I was there with a colleague, and I would have loved to have like, chatted more physics with that colleague, like gone out and enjoyed some tapas. Well, we did go out and have some tapas, but largely I was spending every single waking moment I could resubmitting yeah. this proposal so to some extent it didn't matter where i did that sure. like i could do that sure back in my apartment or sure. there but anyway so that was one another one was flight or oh, this was the most stressful one um flying back to switzerland to set an exam to set the first exam on my course oh. and my flight from albuquerque to denver was delayed missed my connection and then instead of arriving the night before my exam i arrived the morning of my exam with my student and a student and an admin assistant who have very, very kindly bailed me out and set everything up for me, plus a colleague had bailed me out and watched the first yeah. part of it. And then another one where, oh, Heathrow was just crap. And then another one where Heathrow was crap. <laughs> nice. Um, well, here, this is a good segue. Let's travel back to a long time before university, like maybe, mm -hmm. you know, before physics even. Like, uh, what was life like when, when you were a kid? Like, what, what sort of hobbies were you into? And what made you think that physics was eventually a good idea? So I was not interested in physics much as a kid. Um, I could do maths. I like mm -hmm. maths. Um, but definitely sort of as a teenager, physics wasn't, science wasn't respected in my school. It was a girl's school. It wasn't cool. Uh, the cool kids, like it was an academic school. People did actually care about learning. But the cool kids were good at politics, debating, English lit, that kind of thing. Um, and I kind of thought I might do something like anthropology or sociology. I liked philosophy. Um, I thought maybe philosophy. So it was going to be humanity. And then I had one teacher that set slightly harder physics exams. And the rest of the kids were like, this is not fair. I don't like these. And I realized, actually, I kind of enjoy these mm -hmm. um, and so I decided to keep physics going till the age of 18 then decided to do physics and philosophy um, and yeah sort of to my surprise just kept on enjoying physics the more I did it cool um, but oh yeah I was a precocious nerdy kid that liked learning but physics was very much something I accidentally fell into I guys spoke to Marco and I've done one of these with, uh, with Nathan they kind of had uh, I mean they were, you know, into video games and maybe a little different there, but like definitely modest beginnings. Definitely science wasn't like a, well, they, they were both good at like math and yeah, you know, exactly. they, they, <laughs> they eventually took on to science very quickly, but like uh, modest beginnings, I guess, was a common theme and same for you, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> no, like I always liked learning. I was, I was, I was actually paying attention to school. Mm -hmm. 
but oh, you know what? Um, so this is a funny one. I decided to do art at GCSE just for something different. So that's the Say that again, sorry? art for GCSE. Okay, so you, okay. You get to pick what subjects you study to the age of sixteen. Yeah. And you get you have like the core ones you have to do, and then you get to pick some options. And I picked art as an option, and I put more time into art than the rest of my subjects put together because the others were like kind of straightforward enough. I knew I could pass them without sure. really thinking about it too much. Whereas art, I was crap at, but sort of enjoyed the challenge. Right. Um, and actually in the end did really well at it because that was just what I decided to focus on. Nice. And then it's funny, I've not really done any since then. Um, just kind of sad or something I enjoy, but if I ever, I don't know, break a leg and <laughs> maybe I'll start doing something. Sure, else. sure, nice. Okay, so out of uh, high school in, in England, do you call, is it secondary school? Or do you call it secondary high, school? Secondary school. Okay, so out of secondary school, you go, at, go to the University of Oxford. Yeah. Um, I guess maybe we can talk a bit about like life as an undergrad student. Like for me, I felt really burnt out after my undergrad. Like a lot of it caught up with me in grad school, like just buried my head in books and then, you know, just crashed and burned pretty much in grad school. But what was something really valuable that you, you learned while, while in grad school and like... So it's different in the UK. We don't really have the concept of grad school so much. Okay. Um, so I did my four year undergrad physics and philosophy right. um, with the fourth year kind of being a master's year. And then I did a four year PhD with the first year kind of being a master's year. Oh, I and see. So okay. in my case, the first year of the PhD that so had some taught courses in the first six months, but I actually done most of it the year before and I was back living in London and life was good. And so that first year I got on really well with the group of people starting at the same time. I discovered climbing. I was enjoying life in London. It was a good year. So I don't want to answer your question. So I didn't really have a, what did you learn in grad school? And then okay, what did I learn during my PhD? Yeah. That question? Or? Oh, well, so for me, what I learned during my undergrad was that I- Oh, you mean undergrad? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Your first three years, I guess. I, yeah, the, I guess the line's a little blurred between undergrad and grad school or PhD. Yeah. Like the master's is like one foot in an undergrad and one foot yeah. in a PhD kind of thing. But yeah, is there anything that you, because obviously, well, at least for me, grad school was very different structurally speaking. Like no, there weren't a lot of courses. Like ev obviously everything's just like, you know, the world is yours, do whatever you want kind of thing, like research. Whereas undergrad is courses, assignments, exams, like very structured. And yeah. for me, like the biggest thing I learned was spent way too much time like bearing my head to do it on exams when it probably didn't really make that big of a difference honestly and burnt myself out in the process anything like that it could have been just that you just managed your no 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 you know? so i <laughs> when i arrived as first year of undergrad i'd taken a year out between school and university because when it first came to apply to university i had no idea what i wanted to study so I was still at the maybe I want to do sociology and politics. Oh, I stage. see. Okay. So I just didn't apply first time around. And then that meant that I ended up with a year that I needed to fill. And I had spent the first chunk of it earning some money in a demoralizing job um, <laughs> in customer care for a mouth guard manufacturer. And then the second half, I spent some time in Berlin trying to learn German, which was super fun on a tiny budget. And then I did some traveling around Eastern Europe, again, cool. on a tiny budget, sort of um, couch surfing, hitchhiking, that kind of thing. Cool. Um, so then I got to university having had this year out of the system and it was a massive shock. One, I found the social side of things tricky. Um, I just had a year of mixing with a complete mix of different people and then found that I was very much in collegiate life. It was sort of the girls and the guys getting dressed up to go out and that wasn't really my vibe. Secondly, I'd forgotten all my maths and physics. And I vibe, <laughs> like, oh God, I, like, I really, like, I'm, I'm gonna fail. I can't do any of this. I'd just forgotten how to integrate. Um, <laughs> so I spent the first year terrified I was gonna fail um, and then didn't fail. And then really took to it more second and third year um, by which I mean, in terms of physics, as you say, I learned how to pass exams. Um, some of it I learned, like I remember my first quantum course, I clicked, I liked it. it, I felt like it made sense that, but for some other subjects, I feel like I was learning how to pass exams because there is an art to passing exams, which is different to learning how to do physics. Absolutely, um, yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, and then the philosophy I really enjoyed, like philosophy of physics, and for that you couldn't cheat. 
actually that. In right. order to pass philosophy of physics exams, you actually needed to understand the physics. Um, sure. So I think in some ways I learned more from those Interesting. than the okay. physics courses, because the physics courses I accidentally learned how to pass exams rather than learn physics. Yeah, good point. Um, I can, I can, I, I never had a course like that, like philosophy of physics, but uh, no, I totally resonate with like, there's a very clear difference between like actually learning in class and like learning how so to pass exams. The philosophy of physics isn't maybe what you think of. Okay. Um, so for example, one question was um, rigorously derived element transformations. Oh. So making sure you make all assumptions clear. <laughs> or what are the Bell inequalities? How do you derive them and what do they tell us? Okay. Um, so it's okay. So not like philosophical, like metaphysical kind of things. Sometimes you had metaphysical questions. Okay. Um, so for example, what is the role of probability in quantum mechanics? How does this compare to the role of probability in statistical mechanics? Okay. Um, so that's got a more philosophical element. But in order to answer that, you really need to understand right. what is the Born rule? How can the Born rule be derived? It doesn't even make sense to try and derive the Born rule. Do you want to try and derive it from a Dutch book argument or from a Bayesian perspective? Um, so it's there are calculations and sort of ideas that go into it. And I actually think all of that training I use as much, if not more, than much of my physics training in being a researcher. That's really interesting. I think that's some that's that's kind of a gap we have in North American, well, at least in Canada. It's everywhere. Um, yeah. I think Oxford is pretty unique in um, having this physics and philosophy course. You don't yeah. get in that many places. Yeah, that's that's like super interesting. It, does the University of Oxford like post courses online like MIT does at all? No, they're pretty. No, I don't think so. <laughs> They keep that stuff pretty, pretty. They hold that stuff pretty close. I can probably find yeah. a textbook yeah, on it. That's interesting. Cool. All right. Interesting. Um, all right. So yeah, like kind of right when you were starting your life as like a young physics student was like the like big boom in machine learning in physics. Um, so your PhD was in quantum thermodynamics, right? Yeah. So now you're. I mean, obviously, there's applications to quantum thermo. Or, quantum thermodynamics, statistical mechanics in quantum computing, machine learning, like tons and tons and tons. But like, what was the biggest adjustment you had to make coming out of school to kind of make a pivot from that into like classical machine learning, quantum computing, quantum information, stuff like that? Okay, so the machine learning revolution went completely over my head at that time. So the Oxford course was unbelievably backwards. We had, it hadn't been modernized, I think, in, I mean, don't quote me on this. I, maybe it has been modernized and I don't know about it, but it felt like it had not been modernized in about 30 years. Um, okay, so some of the stuff in the quantum info course was new, but I had no formal teaching in any numerical methods, any programming. Interesting, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, that was all just self-taught. Mm -hmm. um, and then the imperial course, so the, the sort of the taught six months as part of the masters, we had some, um, we had like a Mathematica course, but again, I don't think we had much else in terms of programming teaching. And certainly no, in neither place did we have any formal machine learning based courses. Um, so that for me is something that I've caught up on later. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I did get a strong background in quantum information theory, quantum computing, quantum optics from both the Oxford courses and the Imperial courses. Okay. Um, so, and that, sort of led naturally to my PhD in quantum thermodynamics, which was sort of quantum thermodynamics from a quantum information theoretic perspective, plus a sort of quantum device perspective. So try, I was trying to bridge a gap. So the idea was you have these quantum information theoretic approaches to quantum thermodynamics. Some people questioned how experimentally realizable they were, how practical they were. I was meant to be trying to come up with experiments, toy experiments, nothing really actually too practical to implement them. So I was kind of bridging these two worlds between mm -hmm. quantum devices and quantum information theory. Um, and yeah, it was only really as a postdoc that I started to pivot towards um, machine learning and quantum machine learning. Did you ever feel like the rug was being pulled out under you kind of, or like, did you find that transition to be relatively smooth and, and like... It's been gradual. I've sort yeah. of been, it's, it's like a pot in boiling, a frog in boiling water. As we sort of, if the water slowly heats up, it doesn't jump out, but if you throw it in, it's going to jump straight out. Um, I see. So I've, I've suddenly realized that I'm doing more and more things related to machine learning without noticing that somehow I can suck into that direction. Cool. 
Um, we do some kind of fun, random, completely non-physics related or career related questions. That's called oh, random no. sampling. Oh no. Don't have, you don't have to be scared at all. Like it's going to be super fun. Um, okay. So you mentioned that you climb. It's, I, I'm, I'm astounded, um, by how many people since I've come to Xanadu climb for a hobby. Like I have never been around so many people that like enjoy climbing. It's kind of funny. Um, but I'm kind of wondering, like, do climbers have, like, okay, so let me back up. Surfers, you know how, like, Californian surfers sound? They, like, tread waves, bro, and they, like, end every sentence in bro. Yeah. Do climbers have, like, a banter, or do they yeah, have yeah, sayings? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. so, like, how do I sound like a climber? Oh, no, no, you just have to learn the vocabulary. Okay. Um, so you can talk about sending a route. Or sending a route? Sending a route. Okay. Um, you can talk about it being a sandbag. A sandbag, um, okay. Like, I mean, there are climbing dictionaries. There, there okay. must be a oh, hundred plus words in the climate dictionary. Okay, that you slowly pick up over time. Okay, okay. So I just need to go find that dictionary yeah, exactly. and and or can... just hang around climbers long enough and okay. as with all language acquisition, you'll pick right. it up. <laughs> cool. Um, okay. Do you remember what your first cell phone was, and do you yearn for those simpler times? Oh, I remember playing Snake on the bus to school for years on end. No, no, no. Actually, it wasn't that many years because I must have that phone must have died at some point, and then I upgraded to Bounce. I played Bounce on the bus to school. Okay. Remember that one? No, no. Um, it was like a little ball and like little obstacles that you had to go over. No. Uh, but anyway, it would have been. I think my first phone was like a. You don't remember that? You think I had Bounce? Um, my, it was all. They were all Nokia's, so it would okay. have been like a brick Nokia. Yeah, yeah. I was quite a late adopter for smartphones. Okay. Um, I had like a. I was going to say, I know I'm not going to swear, it's something I froze. <laughs> There's no way, other way of putting it. It was like a Android yeah. that in theory was a smartphone, but if you actually tried to do anything on the internet, they are. So that was my first smartphone. Right. That was is like late teens, early, no, that was in my early 20s. I think we've all had that Android. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, to one of those two, yeah. And that, I had that when I did, oh, I traveled a lot at that time. It was really nice. I did a trip around the US actually mm. on Greyhounds and couchsurfing when I was 21. And I had that Android and it was so, at that point people were trying to use the internet to do things like find maps and figure out where sure. you were going. Sure. But this was so bad that it didn't really help with that. So I was still having to like go to a bus station, try and find a map, go to like an internet cafe and print out maps. Oh, throwback. Um, Okay. Okay, and then after that, I moved on to iPhones, and I have been on iPhones ever since. But always the basic one. Yep. Yeah, I'm like, this is like an iPhone. Yeah, I'm like five years behind or something. Yeah. yeah. It still still functions yeah, it very works. well. Well, actually, mine doesn't right now. But <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, okay, so now that you live in Switzerland, like, how many languages do you speak, and or how many languages do you need to know? All you need to know is English. Right. Which is the thing that makes it tricky. So, my German is less terrible than my other languages. Um, if I was in the German speaking part, I think I would have improved my German quite a bit by now. My French was, I'd learned it in school and then forgotten it completely. And then six months of being there, I got to the stage where I could butcher my way through conversations again. But I don't have much opportunity to speak it. Okay. Um, and I'm not really someone who enjoys learning languages. So it's kind of stayed at the level where I will just butcher my way through conversations. Okay. But you really need to just know English. You when... really just need to know English. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, all right, so we, we started this whole thing with a little bit of a Canadiana experience yeah. or talking about it. I have another Canadian experience. Okay. Now, um, when uh, in, in QHack 2022, when you did a talk, you'd mentioned at the end that someone challenged you to like some kind of silly eating competition. Oh, God, is that what those... No, 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 no. I'm not going to challenge you to eat 20 Timbits <laughs> in, in like the five minutes or whatever, but I feel like we could just have a Timbit tasting. Okay, have have sure. you ever had a Timbit? No, I've never had a Timbit. Okay, okay. And I, to be honest, I, I, I like bizarre food that I need to take try from different places. Okay, okay. So. Cool, cool. So I went to a Tim Hortons. Tim Hortons is like Canada's uh, ubiquitous breakfast fast food kind of place. Uh, you know, it used to just be like a donut shop. So uh, these are donut balls, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, funnily enough too, Tim Hortons is founded by a hockey player named Tim Horton. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, so you see how embedded hockey is in our culture. I, I, I see that. <laughs> okay, so you can dig in. We can just you know have. So I will warn you. So I I'm a big fan of food and I'm a big fan of sweet things. Mm -hmm. 
donuts or something that don't really do it for me. Really? Yeah. Okay. So okay. I'll try and see. So, I, I like the um the cinnamon ones that we had yesterday. So I like the ones that are warm, they're okay. fresh cinnamon on. But I'll never go for like an iced bun. I see. And I actively dislike Krispy Kremes. So I'm warning you, if I dislike these, it's nothing I won't take personal personally. to, and it's not an insult to Canada. It's just I don't like donuts that much. Okay. Cool. Well. So there are more flavors than just three, but the Tim Hortons I went to this morning only had three. So the golden ones are honey dip. Oh, I, okay. I was going to say I have to guess. Okay. And then the brown ones are like uh, chocolate glazed. Mm -hmm. And then the ones with sprinkles are birthday cake. It doesn't do it for you. It's a nice donut. I was hoping at least it'd have like a maple flavor. There is a maple Timbit. Uh -huh. that they just didn't have any. How about a magic trick? <gasps> you, can, you don't have to eat them all. Yeah, just like one bite's fine. I won't be offended. So this is Christmas cake. Uh, birthday cake. Birthday cake. Yeah. Um, so it's exactly the same as the other one, but with some sprinkles on it. And like the icing flavoring is like a little, a little different. Mm. Okay, that is different. I am getting birthday cake vibes. Mm -hmm. These are my to be favorite. Honest, it's slightly nauseating, but also addictive at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I, I can kind of see that. If I were to eat too many of these. Mm -hmm. It'd be nauseating, but when I was like, when these, when the birthday cake, these are a newer Tim, but the birthday cake ones that kind of like were a staple, they've become a staple. This with like a Tim Hortons coffee is just like a, I would usually just get like 10 of the birthday cake Tim bits and just. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. You do need the coffee with it. Mm -hmm. Yep. And this is chocolate. Chocolate glazed. Those aren't my favorite, but they seem to be a lot of, a lot of people's favorites. No. Yeah, those don't do it for me either. A notable shout outs that weren't there were um, uh, jelly filled, like a powdered jelly filled one. I love those. They didn't even have, the, I was going to get like a donut, a proper donut, but they didn't have the donut either. What else? This <sighs> tastes to me like a chocolate cake from a supermarket for someone's birthday. Okay. So it's more cake like than donut like. Okay. Which isn't a bad thing. Okay. But also those tend to be made with slightly underwhelming cocoa powder and mm -hmm. don't actually have a strong coconut other than that chocolate flavor. Yeah, like a lot of the, a lot of these are just like pure sugar. Eh? Yeah. Um, I like Putin. I yep. was initially scared of the curds. Cheese curds, yeah. yeah. And so unintentionally left them almost to last. And then when I had them, I did like them. Cool. Yeah, no, they're good. I, for me, I, like with with poutine, I like to just have, actually have like shredded mozzarella because it it melts a lot easier. But it's just cheesy chips, cheesy chips and gravy, which is a northern classic back in the UK. Oh well, if it's just I don't know why poutine's so like Canadian. It's just the cheese curds, and then why is it eh? Even called poutine. Then? I don't know. I should know this. Okay. I'm, I'm ashamed that I say I'm Canadian and I don't know this. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Okay, uh, one more question. Thank you for trying my Timbits, by the way. If you I'm want sorry, to... I, was, I feel like I was very ungrateful. <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate the experience. Cool, uh, perfect. Um, that's all, yeah, that's all I can ask for. <laughs> um, okay, one, one last question. Halloween's coming up. Are you a big Halloween person? I love Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was a big thing growing up. Not American style as an adult so much, so less okay. on the Halloween party, but of the celebrations around the year, in the UK you get a double whammy. You get Halloween and then a few days later you get Bonfire Night. So Bonfire Night is we celebrate Guy Fawkes failing to blow up Parliament. This is our slightly bizarre national holiday and it's just an excuse to set off lots of fireworks. And so we okay. have these two things back to back. Halloween, you got to dress up and knock on all the doors and do trick or treating. And then when I got too old for that, I'd be the one opening the door to all the kids and sort of, mm -hmm. oh, well, what are you? Are you a... Uh... Like you have to try and guess and that's <laughs> kind of cute and fun. Sure. Um, so yeah, big fan of Halloween. My sister and I used to have competitions about who could make their candy last the longest. Okay. Um, so I think she beat me once and had stale candy come June the next that's year. That's not worth it. No, it's, it's not. It's not worth it. Yeah. Um, it started off because, of course, you could make the other person jealous if you still had some left and they didn't have any left. Mm. Um, but it was taken to the extreme where we ended up with stale candy. Cool. Well, not cool. Okay, so I know that you teach a few courses at uh, EPFL. Um, quantum information theory, 
uh, advanced topics in quantum sciences and technologies and the same course but the introduction version. Um, what are your philosophies on teaching and what's something you've learned from teaching for a while now? I try and make it interactive. Um, I will put the students on the spot and say, what is the answer to this? Can anyone explain what's going wrong here? Um, I was someone that didn't actually enjoy bog standard lectures that much and learnt more through discussions. So I try and make things more discursive. It's easier said than done. Mm. Um, Probably lots of awkward silences. Yes, yes, <laughs> lots of awkward silences. Um, I always learnt by doing problems, by doing hard problems. Um, I'm a big fan of working with other people on problems. One, because you then learn off each other. Two, because that's how research actually is. And mm. three, that means you can do harder problems than you might be able to do by yourself. Um, so I try to set harder problem sheets intentionally to try and push the students. Mm. Um, but in all honesty, I think I'm still learning my teaching philosophy, trying to figure it out. Well, yeah, I mean, that's that's honestly a good philosophy to have is to always yeah. try, and, try and to adapt. Like, yeah. And plus, you've only been teaching for like a year and a half, too. So, I, Yeah, less than that. I did a few lectures this time last year. Oh, and then okay. I did my whole course. I see. And then I've done a few more um, this term. And actually, I start a new course, Quantum Physics 2, next term. And that will be a different style again. So, so far, I've largely taught master's courses. Oh, okay. The okay. students are mature and want to learn. Sure. And it's a yeah. relatively small group that you can have awkward silences and put them on the spot yeah. and prod them a bit. But large auditorium of 100 people. It, See how it goes. I love I I love those awkward silences with a with a, in an auditorium with like a hundred people in it where you can just hear a pin drop. It's just like oh, how do I always used to think in those types of scenarios for the professor like what is going through your head right now? You know, like I used to be that kid to to put up my hand all the time, but I'd sometimes just let the silence marinate for a little bit and just like mm, yes. Indeed. How do you like not 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 that like I'm sadistic and wanted to like watch the professor be tortured, but uh, <laughs> it's just a funny observation, right? Like, why why does that happen? You know, it's just a very socially ubiquitous phenomena in it's university. Funny. Um, maybe I shouldn't say this on air, but we at faculty meetings um, we will have all of the professors there gathering to talk about something, and there'll be the um, head of physics trying to lead the meeting and we'll all turn into the stroppy students that won't put their hand up that won't say anything it's exactly <laughs> the same vibe wow we are uh yeah i guess we just never change yeah <laughs> that's so funny um all right well this is a good place to wrap up but do you have any advice for people trying to get through school into quantum computing like any any thoughts on like academia or industry because i've talked to a few people on on both sides of of that coin uh yeah, any, any last words of advice? That's a big question. Mm, it is. Um, <laughs> for me, I guess the most important thing is to focus on the things that you enjoy mm. and actually get your teeth into something because you enjoy it, because you really want to try and understand it. That's always where I've ended up doing best at things um, is when I have decided... I'm just really stuck and I really don't understand this thing and maybe I think I'm stupid for not understanding it and then dive deep into it and actually emerge out the other side with mm. a way better understanding than if it seemed simple from the outset. Sure. Um, and yeah, I think going into science and at all stages, whether it's going to be master's, PhD, undergrad, research level, and this is something I look for when I'm hiring actually. I want people who actually just get really excited by standing in front of a blackboard and talking about some minute detail that no one else cares about but has been irritating you now for a couple of hours. Sure. I think that's the reason to do it and not sort of ambitions or even like grand visions of changing anything. I mean, I've never really had, forget what I put in grant applications, never really had sort of grand visions of changing mm. anything, really just end up doing things because it's kind of fun. Cool. Right on. Well, that's a great place to end it. Zoe, thanks so much for, cool. for having for for being on here. And uh, I'm sad that you didn't love the Timbits, <laughs> but uh, you know. But like I should say, and thanks for sharing the Timbits. <laughs> it's um, all good. Timbits aren't for everybody, but uh, it is a s symbol of sharing, at least. So I appreciate uh, <laughs> it. Okay. Cool. Well, take care. Cheers.